All right. So with that being said, where is my brother Kwanzaa? Yes. All right. Good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm good doing morning. well. How are you good morning. doing? I'm wonderful. So let me first and foremost, let me tell you something. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna when you come in, pause yourself, mute yourself. There you go. So I'm gonna tell you something about this brother. It's like we have been connected by the hip since like 2018. <laughs> Um, he has served in so many different capacities for the state of Georgia as an elected official. And, but the thing I love about Kwanzaa the most is, is that he found a interest in this industry and has been connected to cannabis in a quiet but subtle way. And this conversation about supplier diversity, um, um, just about the, um, of just the history of supplier diversity, what it means, and why this opportunity is so key and so important today, um, it's going to be a great conversation. So I'm going to let Kwanzaa speak a little bit from his perspective, and then afterwards, um, he and I will talk, and I'm going to throw him some questions. And then I want you guys, if you have a question or if you have something that you want to share, you're going to have a chance to be able to talk with um, with um, um, Congressman um well so Kwanzaa I'm gonna let you take it from here and if you can if you're able to come off cam um, come on camera great but if not you got the floor great great thank you so much I'll come on camera in a sec okay uh, thank you Roz and thank you to M4MM it's really a pleasure to be here um you've been a consistent voice for the voiceless honestly and you know going back to 2018 and a few years before that you know there was just a few people fighting the good fight all over the country, uh, trying to make sure. Uh oh, that's one in the background. I'll wait for that. Um, okay. You know, we've had small groups of people all over the country fighting the good fight, trying to get the conversation on the table to ensure that minorities had a fair shot at this phenomenal opportunity. You know, you've helped to catalyze and, you know, be that that charging voice in this industry that has so many ironies, you know, first of and disconnects. You know, we're most likely as minorities, especially black men, to be incarcerated still for cannabis. We are the most incarcerated right now for cannabis and least likely to be in the C-suite to have licenses, to be successful in plant touching, ancillary business owners. Whereas the opposite is true for white and Caucasian. And uh, that disparity is still very stark. And it is really the underlying thing that we could never lose sight of in any room or conversation, Zoom talk or in person. Um, and I'm thankful that M4MM is continuing to raise the conversation in a variety of ways. And it's not just about talking, but it's also about action. And the action is formal as well as informal. I'm going to break this down into a couple of different categories so that we can kind of unpack it. One, I'll try to tell you a little, and I'm, I'm no way an expert in supplier diversity, but what I can say is my experience has helped to impact hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars through my public service. And I'll start with a little bit about the history of the Atlanta model uh, led by mayor, first African-American mayor, Maynard Jackson. And then I'll go into my service as a school board member, city councilman, and what I saw and what I was able to do. And then post office, my experience in the cannabis industry uh, in co-founding a, a firm. And then lastly, kind of where do we go from here? And I, I think that will give us you know, some pieces that we can use short term, medium and long term. Um, so Atlanta, <clears throat> like many cities in the late 60s, began to see an increase in the number of voters who were of color primarily in, in the South, it was black voters, but in the North and in other parts of the country, it was uh, Latino as well. And uh, in some cases, Asian, we, we began to see these shifts in demographics and these demographic shifts changed the voting turnout numbers. Atlanta in 1973 voted to elect the first African-American mayor in the Southern city. His name was Maynard Holbrook Jackson. And he came from a long line of, of advocates in our community. But one of the things that he did as soon as he got in is he sent a message to the business community that it was going to be mandated that 25% of all contracts on the expansion of Hartsville, 
International Airport, which now is and has maintained the status of being the busiest passenger airport in the world, um, <clears throat> would require 25% of contracts to go to minority small business, women-owned businesses. And that was almost like heresy at that time. And many Southern leaders, not just in Atlanta, uh, white leaders, you know, basically cast them out and tried to get them unelected. They went to the state legislature, the governor, every power that be tried to stop this. And it took about two years, but it ultimately mandated that 25% and that number ended up going up to 39, 33 to 39%, depending upon what the contracts were. It created over 40 millionaires, black millionaires through the process, just requiring that you have to have lawyers who are diverse. You have to have um, a HR team that is diverse. You have to have a combination of contractors who are either architectural engineering, the concession program, everything was diversified. And what I started to experience as a young person growing up in Atlanta was, wow, this diversity impacted our community. You saw many people experience wealth overnight. And even the diversity program went from billions of dollars. And when you divide that number, it was roughly about $450 million that went into the African-American and minority communities. And um, that had an instant impact. And so the change that he was able to cause just by putting his foot down and allowing the contracts to sit on his desk, not making a move and choosing to say no and having enough internal fortitude, intestinal fortitude to hold the line until they got to a yes and a compromise impacted mm -hmm. our city and then ultimately our nation because many other cities began to see this demographic shift and you began to see the Philadelphia, the Baltimore's, the Chicago's, in New York, all of these cities, when you saw a diverse person come in, they immediately turned to the spend. And every government has a spend. And in Atlanta's budget is about a 740 direct budget, $740 million a year. Imagine every year since 1973, 30, at least 33% has gone to minority and women-owned businesses. But sometimes it's greater than that percentage across the board on some projects and some, some contracts and some bids. Now, you multiply that across multiple cities. Think of cities that are diverse. New Orleans, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Newark, Chicago, Atlanta, L.A., even Miami, uh, some of the cities in Texas. So the diversity program started with an African-American, but it ended up spinning out to everyone who, shoot, who has been underrepresented and under included and acknowledged and with lack of participation in the economy that was being generated by these governments. Um, that turned out to be an outstanding thing. And I got the benefit of that as a young person, my brother and I, we got one of the small contracts when we were in high school to do the concession stands. And historically the concession stands were run by, you know, all white families. And we got one of those little contracts as teenagers. So it went from the small spin, and that might have been, you know, a few thousand dollars over the summer, up to billions of dollars that were all mandated to um, allow for participation by diverse people. And successive mayors since that time have done the same thing in Atlanta. After uh, Maynard Jackson, it was Ambassador Andrew Young, he continued the program and expanded it. The same was true with uh, Mayor Bill Campbell. Uh, first female mayor, Mayor Shirley Franklin, uh, Mayor Kasim Reed, and then out to uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms, and then now Andre Dickens. Each of them have maintained this program. And in other cities, the programs have been maintained, but in other cases, we saw a lot of lawsuits come in the late 80s, early 90s to go against these programs. And they were, they were retracted in many places, at the federal level, at the state level, um, but still, they've held a line because it's, it's not really about having a contract and a mandate by law. It's about the spirit and the will and the intentionality of leaders who say, regardless if they're diverse or not, who say they want to do good things and they want to be inclusive and they want to make sure that people are participating in the economies that they're creating. 
So that's government speaking. These same programs began to expand out to the private sector. If you're a bank that did business with the city, there was now a new mandate that you would have a diversity program and where the city chose to do its banking. So everyone had to start presenting numbers of their diversity spin in very rudimentary ways of, hey, so you're Coca-Cola, how much are you spending with the diverse group? Because you're headquarters here in Atlanta. UPS, you are using some of the city's bond financing to expand your headquarters. What are you doing with diverse spins? Now you fast forward organizations, all of these types of organizations are doing over a billion dollars with minority diverse and, and women owned businesses of all types. These, these are programs that started just out of a mayor making an inquiry, a council member asking, hey, your company's relocating to our city, we're giving you an incentive. Who's your HR director? Do you have an opportunity for a diverse person to be in that role? If you have diversity in HR, it ensures diversity in employment because they're going to have a greater propensity and likelihood to ensure that people who look like them have a fair shot at a job. Similarly, for the legal department, if your your general counsel uh, is a person that's diverse, then they can look for diverse lawyers who may not be in the network of the the uh, majority, um, the Caucasian or white. Um, general counsels. And the same is true for finance. So all three of those became other categories. Whenever a company would relocate or ask for something from the city, there was an inquiry as to how those three positions were being utilized to ensure that you had diversity in your, in your C-suite all the way down to the lowest level job in the organization. The other question became, well, what about your board diversity? And so we all as young, young people and elected officials began to understand there are about five or 10 questions that you ask of any company seeking anything from your government. And it was about the spin, about your board diversification, about your hiring practices, about the diversity of your employment, what level job people have in, in, your, uh, in your organization, and then just your direct spin. So this ended up creating a mushroom impact and, and effect on the entire city of Atlanta's ecosystem and the state of Georgia's ecosystem. Our governor, Republican Governor Kemp, who did pass a minority, I mean, a, um, a, a medical marijuana program a couple of years back and is still getting off the ground and just uh, celebrated uh, the kickoff of the program. And uh, True Leaf is one of those. Um, but that program did not impact places where you didn't have leaders that lived up to the same mantle of Mayor Maynard Jackson. Although our state was heavily run by Democrats in Georgia, we didn't have a program that did more than 2% of the spend in Georgia. Georgia's current budget is $32 billion. Now, 2% is still a big number, but it's nowhere near the 30 to 40% that you see in the city of Atlanta. And that disparity still exists. So, one of the things that we are proud of today in Georgia is that our governor is now committed to a 10% program, still nowhere near where we want it to be, but the, it's going in the right direction. And some of that has to do with representation. If you don't have diverse representation generally or very enlightened representation, the idea of diversifying and seeing suppliers that don't look like the traditional suppliers falls on deaf ears and it just doesn't happen. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Bottom line, we need to get more elected officials who will participate in this process. And that means you all still need to talk about voting and make sure people are uh, getting elected and recycling new energy and new life and generating uh, leaders who understand this idea of supplier diversity. Now, fast forward. I was, um, like I said, I grew up in Atlanta. My, I'm the child of parents who worked in the civil rights movement. My father and my mother both in the movement, but my dad in particular was the youngest member of Dr. King's staff. And he served from 1963 to 68 when, when Dr. King was assassinated. Actually, he was at the Lorraine Motel and left that morning before he, um, he passed away. So many people out of the civil rights movement went into politics and they supported that change and obviously fought for the diversity of spin. I was elected to the Atlanta School Board in 2002 and I served there for two and a half years. Our budget there was 500,000. We already had a program in place, but we still had to ask the question 
of staff who might have been diverse, but if you don't ask the question sometimes, because usually the big companies have the resource to participate and the small companies who are usually minority don't have the resource to participate. So you have to do intentional things like charge the big majority companies to have joint ventures, to do mentor protege programs, to uh, do set aside programs and to do strategic alliances that increase the likelihood of success and participation. It's not just saying, hey, we called around and we couldn't find anybody. So we didn't, we didn't have anybody we could spend with. No, so what can you do to be intentional? Find uh, some people who work with you and help them spin out to create a company or find a company that's got an outstanding entrepreneur and expose them to this sector and help them to get started. Great entrepreneurs can be in any business if they know there's an opportunity and there's some intentionality around helping them. That's what we saw uh, begin to happen on the school board. We asked those kind of questions. When I went to the city council in 2005, budget got bigger. The conversation is in the, the thick of what we have going on at the city. And you'd have a lot of back and forth around these types of projects. And we always had to ask the question. And those questions ended up helping people go from zero to a hundred. Sometimes, sometimes it's kept their lights on. Sometimes it, you know, saved their whole business because you were able to say, why are you not honoring the letter of the agreement that you said you had with the city to do business with these people? And, you know, I'm just proud to say that, you know, for instance, on the concession program, our concession program at the city of Atlanta before COVID was a $3 billion program, 10 year contract, $300 million a year. Okay. 30% minimum went to minority companies. Just imagine that. Now that's about a hundred million dollars a year going into minority companies, a billion dollars that you know is guaranteed. But we had to fight for that. And we had to ensure that that stayed intact because sometimes the big companies, again, like we see in cannabis right now, oh, well, there's nobody capable or they have all the access to the banks. And because they have access to capital, they can bring the $2 million necessary to go for a license in a state where it would be very uh, competitive if you could get in the game. But right now, if you don't have access to capital, you're not able to participate. And so we mandated that some of the majority firms even offer extended their credit lines to these diverse suppliers who were smaller and didn't have that level of credit or financial backing. So there's, you know, almost anything is possible if there's a will, but the will has to be in the, in the, either the organization that is the corporate entity, it has to be will in the political bodies. It has to be will in the boards that decide the cannabis. It has to be will from the insiders like John, and, you know, it has to be will from community advocates. And then we need the organizations like M4MM all saying the same thing. When are you going to make sure that the spin is going to people uh, that are diverse and then having metrics and KPIs that you can hold people's feet to the fire because, you know, men and women lie, as Jay-Z said, but the numbers <laughs> don't, right? So, and, and speaking of Jay-Z and speaking of like, this is all, this has been 50 years in the making for that program. This is the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And I just want to acknowledge that I grew up in the hip hop movement and doing graffiti, break dancing and DJing and uh, being a B-boy. So I think all of this stuff weaves together when we think about our industry in the eighties, when they hit us, you know, our community went to jail. Whereas, you know, many other people went to school and now they're in business in cannabis and our, our friends and family members are incarcerated still in some cases or trying to recover from that experience. So we've got a lot in front of us. And, and, you know, so that kind of prompted me. I never was into cannabis growing up. I had friends and family members who, who were into it, but I just, it, it just didn't seem like it made sense. So as a, um, a student in Atlanta, I went away to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology because I wanted to get a patent on a plant. Fast forward 20, almost 30 years, and I got back around plant genetics because after being elected, and you know, you spend 15 years in politics, I, I ran for city council, I served those 13, 14 years, and then ran for mayor. I didn't win that election, but I did support Keisha Lance Bottoms. And I really needed to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And if I, I promise you, if I used cannabis when I was elected, I would have been a much greater elected official. 
And I didn't really discover it until afterwards. I said I needed, I talked to my friends in the industry and I said, I need something that'll make me smarter, make me more focused, more creative, and, you know, be in an enlightened sense. Went to California, Florida, different places, Colorado, and I began to touch the industry. And during that time, the state of Georgia was looking at um, rolling out a program. I connected with the, a brother, Paul Judge, and another brother, uh, Jason Edwards. And we formed an organization, an entity called Theratrue. And we began to pursue a license here in Georgia. Neither one of us were in the, uh, in the cannabis industry. Jason was in real estate. I was in government, entrepreneurship. Paul was in innovation and tech. But we got together and began to learn. And we began to go around the country. And that's when I first met Roz and began to just connect with all the players. And there was just so much disparity that you could see across the board from the suppliers, the manufacturers, to the financiers, to the lawyers, to everyone who was in control, had the majority of the resource, uh, like you even see in tech. Uh, and there was no way to get in because the main barrier to entry is the politics. You've got to get through that level to get a license. And if there are political bodies controlling it, unless it's a pure lottery, there's still a financial component that you have to have. So there's a political and a financial, and we discovered that early. We ended up winning one of the licenses in Georgia, uh, the tier two license. However, I uh, still held up in the contract. Uh, and then we also, I was head of new business development, new markets and government affairs. We won licenses in New Jersey and Ohio. Uh, but when I ran for Congress, I had to step away from the company. And again, when I ran for Lieutenant Governor, I had to step away. So I've had to step away from the company, but through that experience, we talked to so many different players in the game, big companies, small companies, ancillaries. And again, it was the same story. Luckily, our team had some internal financing that helped us to be able to participate in a different way. But for those who didn't, we could see the stark disparity through that process. And, you know, I would always talk to Roz about it, like, here's how it's going. We've got to figure out a strategy. But almost every state is different. So every state has a different mechanic and si mindset about how to um, roll out the program. They're usually concerned about the program more than they are about equity in the beginning. And then you've got to fight for the equity after they rolled out a set of licenses. And the equity should be baked in. But if they don't have an equity program or any type of diversity program like we had here in Atlanta, um, it doesn't happen that way. And still, because Atlanta didn't control the rollout of the program, these are state-controlled programs, Georgia, and thankfully so, did roll out a mandate that you have minority participation. But historically, that might not have been the case. So, you know, we were blessed here in Georgia, and I think there are other states like New Jersey that had done the same, and there's other states now that have rolled these types of programs out. But I, I think one of the things that is kind of a, a resonating theme is We've got to have intentionality because it's really about the spirit and the willpower of all people involved, as I said earlier. The corporate partners, it's not about lip service. And, you know, I've been to Benzinga and, you know, we meet all, you get in the room and you see all these folks and everybody, you know, cannabis is supposed to be a community until it comes down to dividing the money, you know, <laughs> right? We all, everybody can pass the token or whatever, but when it comes down to the spin, we're not passing the purse the same way. Everybody becomes sharks. Everybody becomes territorial. Everybody, they exclude you when the deal gets done. And I think there are some who haven't done that, but I think that is one of the places where we've got to call folks out. Because unlike traditional corporate, you at least get to be in the room. And that is one of the places where you start the conversation. Uh, the other part that is a downer is now you've got all the private equity and the more corporatized Wall Street money coming into the sector in a down economy in this sector. So uh, again, that intentionality around corporate partners, um, our diverse suppliers, elected officials, being educated about how the largest and loudest voice they need to have is about diversity in the supply chain. Um, and then also making sure the bodies, the, the cannabis bodies, whatever they may be uh, that are um, installed in the various states and cities, that they have a mandate inside of their programs. And then the insiders fighting real hard while they're working in these corporate bodies to make sure that they have their own internal metrics. You know, for John and people like that, that I knew who worked in, um, in work with me as a council member who might've worked at Walmart or 
Home Depot or Coca-Cola, we would say, hey, look, I know you're in an awkward position, but tell me where do you think the soft spot is in your organization? Some organizations are soft on HR and they'll open up the HR door. Other organizations are soft on the true supplier spend. And some do all of it, but you find the soft spot in the opening and then you expand from there because there's quality people in every aspect. You get one great supplier diversity person or one great corporate communications person who chooses to be intentional about making sure that ad spend goes to diverse companies. And now you've changed the whole whole organization because the bottom line has changed. And that's really all it's about. So, but we don't get a chance to be at the table to show that we can change the bottom line. And that's where that intentionality and the commitment to our community, even if it means putting your neck on the line, because you're not going to always be in this organization. So you also need to be thinking about where you're going to go next. And if you help set people up now and see them grow, hopefully they will think about you on the other side of the role that you're in, whether it be in public or in private. And obviously, I'm not saying that anybody should do anything wrong, but just be intentional about who you help. Um, Bottom line, one other point that I just want to put on the table is, you know, where the decisions are made, HR, finance, and legal uh, really drives a lot. The C-suite having a commitment to equity and opportunity from a, a, you know, a willpower type perspective. And that's where You know, if you know elected officials, have them to reach out to the CEOs on your behalf. And they can call the company CEOs because they come and knock on their door. What do they need? They need real estate. They need permits and licenses. Sometimes they need a banking partnership. They need lawyers. They need secure. I mean, we know all the ancillary, but some of the things government has a say in. And if your government officials you built a relationship with, you can, you can, empower them with the questions that they should be asking because sometimes we get in the room we don't know what what questions to ask and you can't blame an elected official because there's a lot to learn about i mean you're learning you're dealing with public safety issues you're dealing with housing issues you're dealing with transportation issues cleanliness sanitation you know poverty issues so all if you're doing all that food deserts and then then you got a cannabis program coming you're excited about it you want to see it happen but if you don't ask the right questions of these companies when they come to you, you might have a five-year window when no diversity was on the table. And all you had to do was ask the question. But it's, in, it's incumbent on the M4MM team members and others who are allies to empower these elected officials to know what to ask for and empower these board members to make them smart enough and strong enough to stand up and speak. But some, some, sometimes the board members, you even see them like, wait a minute, how did they vote against that or for that? And because they're not empowered, they're not educated. Uh, they're not enlightened about where this can, these votes, these critical votes can take our industry. I do believe that we have an industry that is, is uh, still growing and changing and evolving. And when we think about the power of supplier diversity, you know, it, it, it has kind of a couple of places where people really accelerate. And the National Minority Supplier Diversity Council is a great organization. If you haven't heard of them, get involved with them. Every They have a chapter in every state in most cities. Um, but they talk about certification first because the certification helps the corporate partner because they're able to say, I have a certified minority company, not one that looks like a minority company, not one that's a shell company, truly 51% uh underrepresented minority in ownership. And then you allow yourself to be developed as an entity. That's the other part. We're all growing. So, you know, we start an entity. It's not, it shouldn't be the same a year later. You should be much better and grow and have more infrastructure in place because a lot of times that's the big challenge. These companies are too small. We can't do business with them. They don't have the capacity. So the capacity building comes from a variety of places, corporate partners like truly and others that there are two and others who are big enough to help grow people, or it comes from government helping or nonprofits helping with capacity. And I know that Raj, you do a lot with sharing best practices formally and informally on how people can, can strengthen up their companies. And then lastly, connecting the dots. Hey, one supplier that's great in Seattle would never get an opportunity in Georgia or Florida unless someone helped connect that dot for them because you're usually too small to get known to get recognized to make that partnership happen so 
all of us have a responsibility to be a little intentional ourselves in trying to connect the dots between uh, various potential winners. If you know a group that does something, hey, try to be an advocate for them, even if they, they're not paying you, because it'll come back to you, I promise you. The more you get known for helping people, the more people will help you. And I think that's one of the things that can make us really accelerate the success of, of supplier diversity to benefit our industry is to make sure that we all take a, a, a step to say, I'm going to help one more company that I don't know or I don't have a direct tie to, but I'm going to try to connect a dot and see what that turns into. It may turn into a consultancy. It may turn into equity and ownership, or it may just turn into a relationship that you've built and you look back in two years and look, both of those partners that you brought together are doing so well that they refer business to you. So I think there's a lot in that referral network. And then lastly, it's the advocacy. You know, av advocacy. We've got to be willing to advocate uh, whether we have a, a, a dog in the fight or not directly. Uh, sometimes people only advocate because they're going to get a win out of it. And, and just doing the right thing is doing the right thing. And I'm committed to doing that. And I think I, I charge everyone else to do the same thing, advocating for mentor and protege programs, advocating for joint ventures, advocating for set asides, advocating for strategic alliances, advocating for the HR, legal, finance, C-suite to be diverse, advocating for the boards to be diverse. You know, we could get one or two diverse members, additional members to the various boards of the major organizations that would make a huge difference we can make that one of our charges if we can make sure that in the ancillary sector we've helped to connect a few extra dots from you know the firms that do security the firms that do lighting the firms that do um supplies and and plant pots and you know it's so much stuff that we you know we can help connect dots on and a lot of times just no one is connected the dots and i think there's opportunity for people who may not have the capacity to put all their money up, but you can be a connector and you can win by being a connector. And after that, you use what you earn to start your own entity in one of those. I mean, it's got to be 500 lanes of opportunity and supplier, supplier opportunity in this sector. And I think it's phenomenal from transportation to heat lamps. I mean, it's just everything you can think of. It yeah. depends upon what part of the country you're in. So I, again, I just want to say thank you, Roz, for having me. Thank you to everyone who's been a, a partner with M4MM, our sponsor, True Leaf. Thank you all for stepping up. It means a lot that you're willing to be consistent in this. Not everyone is willing to, to, to do the philanthropic work, to do the volunteerism, to be intentional about supplier diversity. And that says a lot about your organization. Um, we've got a lot of disparities that we still need to continue fighting a good fight on collectively. I'm committed to it, but I'd also charge everyone who's on this call to, to double down on your commitment, double down on being a part of the solution and being a part of changing this game because this industry is still regenerating itself. Every time we have a downturn, like the price of cannabis goes down to a couple hundred dollars, that means there's an opportunity for new players to step in. There's so much for sale in California now. Hey, figure out a way to participate in a different manner. That's that's usually the opportunity like we see in the stock market. When stocks go down, that's a buying opportunity. So find a way to get in the game and then use that as a, a strategy to bring new solutions. Maybe you take on 51% of a dying company, but they still have all the right bones, if you will. And then you take that company, now you go start supplying somewhere either in that state or in another state I'm not meaning product, obviously, but supplying whatever their ancillary service is. And you might be able to make a win just because you've connected two dots and they they were going to go out of business. And you step in and say, hey, I want to be your minority partner. I actually want to be the majority owner and do a, a purchase, um, like, kind of like a lease purchase or a purchase program. And, you know, over the course of two years, you purchase the company from them, but you get 51 percent control. You're a controlling owner. Now you can go pitch to the true leads and others of the world who want to do diverse spins. And because you're the only one in the space, you increase your likelihood of getting business. That's what I think we have in front of us. There's tons of opportunities and it's really up to us to take advantage of them. Thank you all for having me. And I'll open this up to questions if you don't mind. Or, uh, yes, 
Absolutely. I gotta, I'm gonna start off with a couple questions. And then if you have a question, or if you have a comment, please raise your hand. And, and uh, man, if you didn't drop so many nuggets. Um, Kwanzaa, I want you to talk about um, reading the tea leaves. We are going to have Bankstone, which is the largest workforce development company that is placing people in jobs that there's so much, many opportunities that are open that are still not getting placed. Can you talk about just how we have this desire? We talk about equity from an operator standpoint, touching the plant. However, there are so many opportunities that, you know, you've been at MJ Biz, you can walk up and down those aisles and see all of those opportunities. Can you talk about hobby versus business and how we have to get out of things that we like to do and get in things that are a, a business that has quantifiable opportunity? Right. Great, great nice. question. First of all, I want to say Banks is a phenomenal organization. <laughs> I did have some interaction with them. And I, I met them on the floor of MJ Bizcon, but we can we got somebody a little static, y'all. There we go. There you go. Okay, Thomas. there we go. Sorry. Uh -huh. I just wanted to say so. Oh. Got it. Okay. I'm not sure which. That's Sam. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So one of the great um, points that I recognize being on um, on the floor of MJ BizCon, I walk the aisles and it's a lot of exciting stuff. It's like being in a toy store, right? But when I bumped into banks, I saw a phenomenal opportunity for a group that started by a, a, a woman and she stepped up and began to solve problems, right? And she solved problems for our organization. Well, what you have to do is figure out where you really actually can provide true value where people are paying. I mean, people enjoy cannabis. So cannabis is a great thing. And especially, you know, if you're smoking a lot of indica, and you, it'll slow you down some. And, but if you figure out how to, you know, I have to say that because that does tend to happen. We have fun in the industry and we enjoy the, the lifestyle of the industry and the community of the industry. But if you're trying to get down to business, put all that on the side and look at where the true opportunities are. And when you walk up and down those aisles, you say, okay, you do the research. And every sector has numbers and reports that describe how big the sector is. You know, you just Google, you know, size of, you know, transportation and cannabis. And you start searching on transportation. You can see the size of the sector by state, by type of transportation, by logistics. And it'll break down from there, you know, down to the vehicles, down to the security down to what's inside of the vehicle. So there's so many places where people can, you know, get out of their own way. And even if you, if you love transportation, then that's what you should, you should focus on, get the facts, get the numbers. And if the market is a market that has opportunity for you to grow in it, get in it. If that market is kind of closed or that market doesn't have as much opportunity because it's becoming a commodity, then you find another one that is nearby where you want to use your expertise your passion, your experience, or where you just have a lot of desire to learn to go ahead and get, get about that business. And I think that's what we have in front of us that we never had before. When you walk up and down those aisles at those conferences, every one of those potential vendors has something you could glean from them to use to create your own business. Sometimes I have to tell myself, wait a minute, this, I mean, I want to leave and I come back with you know five new businesses I want to do. But because we were in pursuit of licenses, I couldn't do all those. But we were preparing to do a fund just to create ancillary businesses because there's so much room there. And those of you all who are in those businesses, you know what I'm saying. It's, it's limitless. And it's really up to us to just take advantage of them. And I, and I want to just echo this point. So there, were, there was a group. Uh, they were out of China and they were trying to market their, um, you know, their hardware for vapes and things of that nature. And I pointed one of our members over there and I'm like, go talk to them, talk about what they would do to wholesale, because all it is is supply supplier services and, and demand is basically what what product do you need? How can I get it wholesale for the cheapest amount and sell it back retail? Right. And it's just I mean, it's just like that. So it's just a matter of 
they're there trying to get business, but maybe they don't even realize that the supply diversity conversation is going on and you could have them be your middleman. You could be the middleman and connect the dots and, and make money off of, and not even have, you don't have to have supplies. You don't have to have inventory. You don't have to have anything. You're the middleman that connects the dots to make to, to, to the actual buyer um, who's have, who has to buy that product. So um, I just want to say that. And I, and I think my last question, and then I want to open it up. Can you talk about, um, I guess this is a two-part. How do, how do we get the cannabis industry to make this a priority and also to measure this and, and to be held accountable? And we saw on the, um, when you use your example of the, of the government in Atlanta, the airport, there was some accountability there. And that's where I think we're struggling. And then the second thing is um, explain about mentor protege and joint ventures and how that could be a great way for folks to um, understand a certain area of, of opportunity and then expand from there. Great. So on the accountability standpoint, I mentioned the metrics and the KPIs. The good thing is we've had, you know, at least 50 years of conversation around this and you've got organizations like the National Minority Supplier Diversity Council and others by state and by city that you can reach out to and glean some of the classic ways of tracking and of monitoring and even holding people accountable from some kind of legislative way. So, you know, once you know what the measures are, then you go to your elected officials and say, hey, could you implement, could you introduce a piece of legislation that mandates this? Boom. Or you, so it could be a city counselor, it could be a county commission, it could be an alder, alderman or a woman, or it could be a mayor. And in some states, you've got governors who can do this for you and state legislators. So you depend upon where you are, you get the right leaders to begin to implement that. And it can go down to, you know, when you want to come to our city, you've got to have diversity. The state's on a different page, but on our page, you want to do business in Newark, the requirement is blah, blah, blah. And that's how you add accountability. The other way is surprisingly, who people do business with can dictate who they, I mean, who they do business with. And so if you have any influence over some of the clients of the players that you're trying to get to, the, they can influence them. So what Coca-Cola did was they mandated that if you do business with Coke, you also have to have a supplier diversity program. So the biggest fish drives it down the organization. So if True Leave is being our partner on this and they're really committed, so everybody who does business with True Leave needs to do the same thing and present their numbers. So now you get it going, like I said, from the concession stand all the way up to the billion dollar contracts, but because everyone in the food chain has to commit to being a part of the program. As far as mentor protege programs, there's a, quite a number of reports and studies and now, you know, templates on how to do them. Uh, they come in a variety of programs. There's a construction company or, or two, many of the construction companies in Atlanta do this, and they probably do it in other parts of the country as well. But they will bring in all kinds of trades, no matter what you do. And you go through, you know, kind of a week long seminar or a, a five week seminar, two hours a week, and you learn about their business practices. You learn about the requirements for bonding, for safety, the OSHA, you know, things that people might not have in their, in their program. And the same would be true if you were in transportation and cannabis, if you were um, in growing, if you are in lighting, if you're in construction, there are special nuances that you need to be aware of. And if you don't come in the door knowing those things, or at least are willing to learn them, then you're not going to get actual work. So these things kind of give people an on-ramp to get started, to kind of get them up to speed. And the Mentor Protege program, I can find some reports and some examples of how we've done them. There are a variety of ways you can do them. Some are funded by governments. We could even charge some of the cannabis boards to create them. And then some are formed by corporations. And then in other cases, nonprofits such as M4, uh, MM can set up its own program, get a grant and you can create your program. And someone on the chat said unions also do this uh, to create diversity there. And then lastly, on the uh, joint venture programs, same thing. I mean, you can Google joint ventures, but the general idea is two partners come together. They preserve their entities, but they create another entity and 
sometimes they do a pro rata contribution of their funds to be both on the same team or one group could give greater funds, but the ownership is is separate and in, 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 in the favor of the minority. Let's say it's to a majority minority company. The majority could have, you know, 70% of the money on the table and the minority could have 51% of the ownership. You can always divide money over time. You can say, okay, cool, we'll put all our money up, but when the money starts coming in, our, our revenue starts coming in, we'll split it. And the split will be slightly in favor of the majority who invested. And then as it's paid down, then it all becomes 50-50 split or 51-49 split. So there's ways to kind of skin the cat. I've seen a lot of variety of scenarios because some of these businesses are capital intensive. So you need to have a greater, you know, kind of greater balance sheet to start off. But over time, you can pay it down if it's a successful business. And the charge really is about two, two groups coming together saying we're going to be successful because we're competing against others. And then a lesser version of a joint venture is a strategic alliance where you're working in a way that you're not competing directly with each other, helping each other, throwing business over the fence because one smaller, one's bigger. You don't exactly do the same work, but it's in the same category. So I want to, I want you guys to understand that as we see the growth of this initiative, everybody that's on here, the reason why we're having this summit is because I can't and be the only champion out here saying, hey, supply diversity, supply diversity, right? It has to be us all kind of, here's our sheet music. We are walking down this together. Once it becomes something that there's some measurables, there's opportunities in new states that have new programs that are coming on board and they have a supplier diversity language in there, and you have a company that knows in order to compete for that license, they have to show, um, a, it could be a 30% mandate of supplier diversity. Then what ends up happening is you can go to someone that's a lighting company and say, hey, I'm certified as a minority business enterprise in my state. Um, there's a 30% mandate from supplier diversity. Why don't you and I do a joint venture together? Here's what you give. Here's what you do. And then like, you don't have to do nothing but collect a check because you're not going to carry the lighting. You're not going to carry the, um, you don't have to have the expertise. They do. But that new business that they're trying to, um, um, that new business that they're hoping to bring into their, um, into their, into their eco, it means that much. It's important. And they rather rather get a percentage of something versus a hundred percent of nothing. So I just want to like really encourage you guys to see the big picture. And the reason why I had Kwanzaa on today is because we ain't talking about something that people don't know about. Like we have past performance. We we have all right. And report. Okay, so. So, and here we go. So we got, we have past performance of individuals and, and of entities that have like, this is a program that's set in stone. So we're not talking about something that's brand new. So I just want to make that point. Um, we have A. Hampton, you have a question. Thank, thank you. Um, I do, first of all, let me just say thank you for the information. It's been really helpful. And uh, it is a lot, so it's a little bit overwhelming. And I live in a state that just legalized cannabis. And so come July 1st, it'll be legal. And a lot of the um, organizing around this was making it legal in terms of the community of, of colors push it in that way. Not so much focus on the business part. So given that, what are maybe, if you could just summarize the top one, two, three things that we should be doing right now? Okay, all right. So what first state, of wait, all- First, before you go, yeah, Kwanda, what, what, state? State, what state are you in? Minnesota. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. So, first of all, you want to get down to what the legal guidelines are, what legislation, enabling legislation, was created for your state, because a lot of the rules are already written there, right? So, you get that document, you begin to review the document. If you see things about minority participation, diversity, spend, supplier diversity, all that kind of stuff, then thumbs up. And you begin to use that to guide how you get in the business. If you don't see that, you need to reach out to your elected officials immediately and say, hey, great that you passed the law, but it's going to cause an unintended consequence of creating yet another disparity in a new industry. And raise that alarm quickly and say, here are five other states that have programs that you could mimic. New Jersey, 
or wherever, you know, so we can, Ross can see your list of those that are, you know, considered to be pretty good. Um, and, and Georgia's program is not bad. It just hadn't gotten all the way off the ground. So you take some of those and you share those with your elected officials. If you don't have elected official friends, build relationships. I'd say number two, then you look at what the guidelines say in terms, is it going to be 10 licenses or do they have a $2 million spend? And then where you are coming from as an entrepreneur, what level of investment, what level of time commitment, what level of relationship and politics do you have to play in this game? This is a heavy political game. It's a heavy capital game. And if, you, if you're not coming with either one of those, then you need to link up with people who do have those two and find, you know, get in the, in the network. There's usually uh, pre-bid conferences. There are lobbyists who have to designate who they're registering for. And then you go, if, if these are gonna be big licenses, then you go and look at the same list of who won licenses in the other state, you know, the top MSOs, and you wanna introduce yourself to them. People like John say, hey, John, you have a diversity program. I wanna do X, Y, Z. If you're not big enough to go after the license by yourself, and sometimes we think we're big enough, but we really don't have enough experience and wherewithal and, and track record finance to really get in it. So link up with other people and use the network. There's usually more than one group trying to do it. And it's just figuring out how to come to a deal and not being greedy about forming a partnership. But your elected officials are going to know who's trying to be in the game because we made the decision on the law. And usually someone lobbied us to get the law changed. So the same people who lobbied us are trying to get the work. So they're shaking the tree and trying to catch the apples. You call me and say, hey, I'm, um, I'm trying to get involved here. How do I, okay, these five companies are all the ones you need to talk to. Let me give you their numbers and tell them I told you to call. So if you don't have any good elected officials, go make some friends in that space immediately because they can help you faster than anybody else. Well, and that's good. Thank you. I, I will say on that point, I started with the Black Caucus for the state of Florida, and I went to those lawmakers who, um, and I just kept ringing the alarm of there is a diversity and equity issue, and there's a lot of money coming out of cannabis, and we're not involved. Will you help me? That was it. Hey, my name is Roz McCarthy. We Guess what? Um, I don't know what your first name is. As I know it says A. Hampton, but guess what? We don't have a state director for M4MM in Minnesota. So you right. get you get with an advocacy organization that you don't have to do all the pulling, but we put our state directors in place so that you could tell us what's going on. Tell us, hey, here's three of the lawmakers that said, yeah, you know, they're interested in helping us. And then we have the policy people and we have the language that can give them you know, normally they don't know what to write or exactly how to write it, but that's when you can tap into us that we can say, here's sample language that you can insert into the bill in order to, to support supply diversity. Here's some opportunities to, to um, follow. So I definitely encourage you to become a member, everyone. Jodice will put that in there. And if you're in a state that we don't have a state director and you're looking to lead, because let me tell you something, there is power in being the, the leader. I mean, it's a lot of work. Um, we have um, Nikki on from Indiana. She's our state director there. Yes, it's a lot of work, but also it puts you in the spotlight. And for you to say, I'm the state director for the largest community-based organization focused on equity, health equity, social justice in this industry, that says a lot. So I want to encourage you to think about that as well. Okay. And let me just add, someone just placed the um, good details on the enabling legislation from MPP. And it talks about everything that you want to do. What category do you want to be in if uh, you don't mind me asking? Oh, and I would say this. It's not specifically for me. I actually okay. run, run the Civil Rights Department in the city of Minneapolis in mm, supply nice. diversity. Oh, I, awesome. um, okay. And I've actually had a lot of experience with our legislators. So it really is making sure I know what to ask them for and get community members that I'm connected with connected who want to be in this okay. business. Does that make so, sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Let me just okay. add, I, I, I'm skimming it real quick. So the equity reporting is one of the great, under the business regulations in this, um, it's a great place to utilize that. What's in, what's supposed to be reported and okay. what actually, you know, it, so that's where you want to use, that's your lever, right? If you're in civil <laughs> rights, you can use that as a lever. And then you grab the disparity numbers from who's incarcerated, 
who is participating in business with your cities and your counties and your state, and you put all that together, you can have a conversation with anyone with that. Okay. Now, based on that, you've got the hammer. What you want to do is say, okay, hey, friends, team members, read all this. Do you want to be a retailer? You want to be a cultivator? You're going to be a manufacturer, a micro business, delivery, transporter, lab. You're going to be doing events. Are you in the legacy space? You already been selling weed, you know, whatever mm -hmm. one of these categories they're in, right? Then you say, okay, cool. I'm going to empower you. And you could probably get a group in every category, right? And then have okay. them all come to the table and just be singing from the same sheet of here's what the disparity is. It exists in our jail system, justice system. It exists in our business system. Of course, it exists in education, but then here's where we think it can go. And I've got a company that does this, that wants, or five companies that do lab testing. Each of them have been at chemists and now they've got a lab somewhere and they're doing chemicals for, you know, cleaning, but they could also do lab testing. They just need to be shifted over. So there's kind of the conversion into the sector. And then there's the upstarts that are professional entrepreneurs. And then they're just people who are entrepreneurs who, you want to be able to give a leg up. You need a little bit of each because those who don't have as much experience in entrepreneurship or have a greater likelihood of failing. Uh, those who've been in the black market have a greater likelihood of failing because they've got to go against some barriers, right? But those who are already in corporate or who already have successful businesses have an easier way in, but you want to bring them all together because I promise you, each has a different experience that can make for a better team because it's really about teams winning as opposed to about one individual. Uh, and then you add, you know, things like background, if that is legal or not for people to have felonies or to have been incarcerated, if it gives you points or if it takes away points is a big difference. Short term, a lot of people don't give you points for that. So what you want to do is use that as a, a talking point later and just find clean people. If it doesn't work that way and you can bring in folks who have felonies then you want to find those who were impacted by the war on drugs. So it just depends on strategically what's going on in that city. And I put my email in there. I love to continue to dialogue and, and help to offer ideas and be a part of the solution. I love Thank it. You. Thank you both. This was really great. Awesome. Don't go anywhere because I'm going to make sure I'm going to give you our, give you my contact information. Um, I'm thank you for explaining your role. So you may not be the state director, but what we can do is also be a, a support and a, and a resource for what you're trying to achieve and work to maybe raise the conversation in Minnesota because we have not done any, a, a lot of work in Minnesota. And we need to um, to do some work and support. So um, I will get that, get my information to you. All right. All right, guys. So we are moving on. Thank you. First and foremost, Congressman Kwanzaa Hall, my friend, um, my brother, um, my colleague, um, you're in this, this journey together with me. I appreciate you for just taking time this morning and being with us and, and feel free to hang out if you'd like to. But um, you know, thank you so much for just, just dropping those nuggets and encouraging us to fight this fight. It's worth it. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for the questions and look forward to staying in touch. I'm on social media and my emails in the chat. All righty. So guys, we're, tra we're, trans we're transitioning to our next phase in our conversation. And this is where the rubber meets the road. And so you've had a company like Truly that said, you know what, this is a priority. And there is not a, the state of Florida um, where Truly is their corporate offices and that's where they started. Um, in, in 2017, I'm proud to say that I was responsible along with Eric Range and a few other colleagues of asking and working with lawmakers to put diversity language in Florida's medical marijuana program law. So in the state of Florida, we were able to do a couple of different things. Um, we were able to get FAMU at, um, identified as a, um, as a, mar as a research uh, marijuana Research Entity University, and ten dollars of every um, seventy-five dollars that um, when people renew their card or get their card goes to FAMU for research. We were also able to get in language that requires every operator in the state of Florida, upon um, their initial application and any renewals, mm -hmm. that they have to present a diversity um, plan that encompasses hiring, community outreach, supplier diversity, um, and so. Uh, these are things that we've been able to do. 
um, we still have a lot of work. And that work means how do we make sure that whatever is turned in by these different operators is actually being executed? Their plans are actually real plans. And so True Leaf has been one that stepped up and they are really um, here with their buyers to talk about the, their role, their responsibility and what they do and what 